Uh, joining uh, me now, Jeremy Gilbert, professor of cultural and political theory at the University of East London, and Alex Williams, lecturer in digital media and society at the University of East Anglia. Uh, they are co-authors of their recent Hegemony Now, How Big Tech and Wall Street Won the World and How We Win It Back, in parentheses. Uh, 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 Jeremy and uh, Alex, uh, welcome to the program. Just want to say, uh, for everyone to understand out there, those are not ukuleles behind you. Uh, no. Those are, in <laughs> fact, guitars, uh, but uh, uh, wide-angle lenses. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks very much for having us. I'm a big fan of the show. Oh, well, thank you. Um, well, let's just start with this. Let's a uh, little remedial to just start the first question with the uh, title of the book, but hegemony. In the context of what you're talking about, uh, what 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 does that mean? Well, so hegemony is a term which comes from the writings of the Italian communist Antonio Gramsci. I mean, it's a word that has some other meanings in other contexts, but in the tradition of radical political theory, really, it translates an Italian word, which is more usually translated as leadership. So basically, that's what it means. And it def what it refers to is the ability of relatively small groups in a society to, uh, to exercise a kind of leadership over the rest of the society. So the way we like to explain this is to say that hegemony is basically the capacity to determine the general direction of travel for a society or a group or indeed for the whole planet. So that's basically what we mean by it. All right. And, and fair enough. And so, Alex, uh, 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 as you guys write this, um, it's so much of like what we talk about uh, on this program, uh, much of this um, this uh, hegemony begins or at least the th those who who are in a position of, of of having hegemony over the direction of society starts in the 70s um, as we enter into an era of financialization and also almost simultaneously the development of new uh, technology that both enhances the ability for financialization and then also becomes sort of platforms in and of itself. Uh, give us a little bit of that history. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really uh, uh, kind of nice way of introducing it. I mean, a lot of the time, neither of those things is really mentioned when you, when you think about um, the 1970s. Certainly a lot of academics and kind of leftist commentators would rather talk about neoliberalism, right? So they'd be talking about um, maybe about uh, Thatcher Reagan, um, maybe about uh, the Mont Pelerin Society and Friedrich von Hayek and uh, Friedman um, and all of that. And certainly all of that is very important. Um, the slightly less remarked upon component of their ability to um, implement neoliberalism, you know, first of all, in the kind of uh, Anglophone world and then later on uh, across Europe and then the rest of the world, um, a lot of what enabled them to do that was exactly the fact that, um, you know, financialization could occur, that, you know, technology allowed things like, uh, you know, disaggregation of production systems. So, you know, you could crush your working class within America or, or, or the UK um, because much of your production was going to be happening in uh, Southeast Asia. And all of this involves um, the emergence of kind of computerization later to the Internet. Um, and the liberalization of finance. And all of these things kind of happen together and are kind of, uh, they're, they're all involved in this kind of um, process. And very much today when we look around, you know, who is it um, who's managed to get what they want? You know, who's, who's, which groups in society have managed to kind of achieve their aims best of all? And it wasn't the kind of uh, Thatcher Reagan conservatives because, you know, they'd look at, sort of much of modern society and be and be pretty aghast at, at, at the kind of the lack of social conservatism um and instead they uh the people who've really got what they want are the people who work in you know big finance and big tech they, they've achieved most of what they want if you look around us i want to i want to just i, I want to uh, examine that last point a little bit too because i i think you know Part, it feels to me like part of Thatcher and and Reagan's agenda was also th this sort of like neoliberal economics. They, I, I think, they also, at least in Reagan's case, was was very conscious of like you know um, who was going to be the wind under his sails, as it were. Uh, but let's, I mean, just for the sake of uh, of folks who don't fully understand the concept of financialization, 
w- give us a sense of like what the difference is between a, um, you know, uh, w- w- what financialization means in terms of like when we're talking about, we- we've moved from something where, you know, we're just talking about uh, uh, companies uh, making money via producing things and, and putting it out there, providing services to, to what when we talk about financialization? Yeah, you're talking about a shift from an economy which, in which indeed, as you say, in which the, the bottom line of companies is mainly a function of how well they produce stuff and get it out to people who want to buy it, to one in which that's relatively secondary. And the thing that really determines the profitability and the share price of companies is just their ability to engage in these kind of speculations on the, on the rising prices of assets, the rising prices of shares, oh, and, and, and above all on debt, actually. I mean, the whole economy, I mean, the big shift towards a kind of financialized economy from the 70s onwards is a shift to an economy that, based, that is based on debt and, the, and, it, and a shift towards an economy where how rich you are either as, a, as a corporation depends on how much debt you can sell to people and to other, including other corporations. But also people's standard of living as consumers increasingly depends on access to cheap credit, on access to, you know, rather than their actual real wages, you know, Comparing real wages at different historical moments is notoriously quite difficult. But, you know, on some measures, real wages and certainly wages as a share of the overall economy are stagnating, really, from the early 70s onwards, like uh, pretty much indefinitely with some little blips subsequently. And so people are, you know, people are only able to enjoy this increase in their standard of living, you know, the cheap vacations, the big TVs, you know, the things that have kind of made life relatively tolerable for people over the past few decades, they've only been able to experience those things through um, access to consumer credit, through access to various kinds of debt. And of course, to come back to your earlier point, one of the things that often isn't really remarked upon is that all of this is dependent upon the rolling out of communications technologies. It's dependent on credit cards. It's dependent on the computerization of the stock markets and the banks in the 1980s. It's really physically dependent on all of those processes. And then eventually you get into a situation like the one we're in now, where really, I mean, you, you know, even things like education are kind of seen as sites of speculative investment. They're seen as uh, they're seen as things which corporations want to make money from, and but they don't even want to make money really from like delivering high quality services, which is the kind of the headline claim of uh, neoliberalism and advocates for school reform and charter schools and things like this really what they want to do is they just want to they want to get get kind of monopoly control of delivering services in certain areas and then they want people to invest they want their investors to give them money on the basis of the assumption that that's going to deliver you know increased profitability at some time in the future so financialization uh, to some extent leads to this situation in which the entire economy is driven by speculate by speculation on, on the future and on, and on a kind of permanent set of bets on on you know the the permanent inflation of asset prices share prices you know property prices land prices and you know even even stuff like bitcoin so uh so that is what is involved i mean that is what we mean by financialization of course also at the level of kind of political sociology, if you like. It's also about the question of, well, who are the most powerful sections of the capitalist class? I mean, from a Marxian perspective, you can say that going right back to the 19th century, there's often a tension within capitalism, within the capitalist class, between, on the one hand, industrial capital, manufacturers, the people who actually make stuff, and on the other hand, finance capital, the banks, the people who lend them the money to make stuff. And they have convergent interests on a certain time scale and in certain ways, but often within a short to medium term, they have quite different interests. And what's really distinctive about the, say, the American economy in the post-war period is that manufacturing, the manufacturing capital, industrial capital, is really in a privileged position. You've got government, you've got unions, you've got a whole kind of regime which is designed to protect their interests. And finance capital has, re- has been put in a box. There's all these rules about what, how much speculation they're allowed to engage in, how much currency speculation, how much lending they're allowed to do, how they're allowed to, who they're allowed to, who they're allowed to lend money to. And one of the big objectives of the whole neoliberal project of the 70s, 80s and onwards is to, as David Harvey said years ago, is to restore the power of finance capital, you know, to get those people, you know, to liberate it, to get those people out of the box. And that's a really big part of what happens over that period, I think. 
and and in many respects, I mean, and um, it, it seems that during that period, the the conflict between the sort of the industrialists and the uh, finance capitalists seems to also break down on some level in the sense that once we get into an era in this country anywheres where where capital is taxed at a much lower rate capital gains is taxed at a much mm-hmm. lower rate than uh than 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 working for a living um the the incentive structure for CEOs and board of directors changes dramatically from I am judged exclusively on the basis of what I produce and how I set up a five-year plan for this manufacturing outfit and this and that to all of a sudden like, well, wait a second, I'm actually making my money on the stock price, yeah. which oh, is hold a value, baby. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, 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 <laughs> and then all of a sudden it becomes like, well, I can juice the stock price by, by just creating a Delta between our revenue and our costs. And I don't have to necessarily raise the revenue I could lower the cost and that may have, that may cut into the value of this company five or 10 years down the road, but my stocks vest four years from now. And so I don't care. I mean, that that's a little bit, I think, crass and obvious, but that is, seems to be the dynamic. And, and suddenly these companies themselves, all the leadership of them perceive themselves as financialized entities in and of themselves. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Yeah. All right. And the well, interesting, so, uh, go and ahead, the interesting no, thing is just what happens beyond the just corporations when you're thinking about financialization. It's not just your corporate executives who are thinking of themselves as financialized entities. It's a lot of ordinary people as well, in a certain sense. Yeah, you have these guys. These guys are the guys with the most high paying jobs in the world. They're rolling out their schemes, recruiting people from the Ivy League. So, that, so you so you go through high school and college knowing if you want to join these masters of the universe, you've got to think like that too. You've got to think like one of these short-term, aggressively profit-seeking, speculative finance capitalists. Then it goes, you know, it goes further. Politics because that's where all the money is. So that's where, and and they start rolling out policies which which start saying even people, even public servants have to think the same way. You know, even if you're if you're managing a school, you know, for reasons we've already alluded to, you, you have you have to think the same way. You end up in a world you end up in a world where like teenagers are watching TikTok videos telling them how they have to be hustlers. You know, and it's all basically the same kind of logic of thinking which proceeds from that. And that's what we mean by hegemony. That's the way in which, you know, these particular powerful forces are able to disseminate a kind of particular way of thinking about the world, a whole kind of pattern of thinking about the world, if you like, what what Gramsci calls a common sense. You know? um, and I think that's a really good example of how a, a particular kind of common sense gets sort of disseminated. And then you end up in a situation where e- everybody is living in a society like the ones we live in today, even if they hate all that stuff, they kind of know that's the rules of the game. They kind of know that those are the rules you have to play by, even if you hate it. And yeah, let's talk, let's talk about this, because I mean, I had this conversation, particularly like in the context of, of TikTok and Instagram. And I was, you know, saying to, uh, you know, in the context of, of, of my children saying like, you know, basically my kid is learning to commodify herself and getting, you know, a cash substitute in the form of likes. And this has become... And, and, and I was talking to someone who was, you know, fairly sympathetic in terms of, uh, of politics, but the idea of like my saying we should get rid of, we, we should just simply outlaw, uh, most algorithms as far as they work on, on, on online and, and get rid of these sort of like mechanisms, which are basically training people to commodify themselves in some fashion or another was met with like a, just wait, what? Like, that's crazy. <laughs> Even though we had agreed on sort of all the problems, like the idea of, of getting rid of those things just seemed completely. And that's what, when you, when you write about uh, uh, the, your theory of passive consent, um, give us a sense of what that is. Um, and, and, and maybe we've just described it. Yeah. I mean, in a, th- uh, in a sense, we, we've absolutely just described it. So, I mean, I think there's an example that, that, that I wrote in the book, which was about Twitter, right? So, we're all familiar, I think, especially on the left with people who, you know, spend all of their time tweeting, posting, um, largely about how much they hate Twitter, how it's a <laughs> hell site, how it's ruining public discourse. Um, but they are the ones who are feeding the algorithm and they're engaging with it. And, you know, pretty much they're doing everything, you know, that that, that Twitter would want them to do. They're generating 
value for the company through engagement. And, you know, providing you don't resist, uh, you are passively consenting, even if you are critical, um, ostensibly. And if we're thinking about, you know, how these, these kinds of platforms are designed, um, yes, it's about the algorithms, certainly. And we can talk about various platforms, you know, for example, uh, the example which came up in the, in the kind of uh, Facebook whistleblower uh, papers um, six months or so ago, where, you know, it was revealed that they were overweighting the angry response emoji something like four times compared to all of the other ones because they, you know, not because they wanted to drive America, cr you know, crazy with anger, um, although that might have been one of the effects. It was just people engage more when they're angry. Um, but even beyond that, you just, you know, you mentioned the kind of, um, on TikTok, the kind of version of cash being, you know, likes and, and, and you know, all of the, the kind of metrics involved in it. The very fact that our digital social environment is completely, you know, filled with metrics, everything has a number on it. You know, you are kind of inculcated, you're kind of led to make the number go up, make the number increase in value. And um, on that kind of basic design level, they are designing for you to kind of passively consent to behave in a certain way. And that way is absolutely, you know, uh, in keeping with neoliberalism, I and mean, we describe it as sort of competitive, possessive individualism. You know, you could have social networks um, and social media sites set up to kind of foster creativity and collaboration and, uh, you know, kind of nuanced <laughs> thinking. But instead, it's all about um, uh, heightened emotion, uh, extremely pithy and, uh, you know, very much focused on how do I maximize my return? How do I make my numbers go up? Yeah. And so, it, and 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 that has become pervasive. And and the way that we got there was that was was I mean, just because early at one stage in the development of the internet, it was, and I guess it it combines. I guess there this is where it also combines in terms of finance. It's like there is we're not making any money off of what we've created, uh, and which every major I think like every major tech platform um, at the very least in their first, like whatever percentage of their existence made no money, but mm. it was all based upon these measures of engagement. Even when there wasn't a clear, like how are you going to make money off of this? It doesn't matter. We have X number million of users. They spend this much time on the platform. So all of the incentive structure is, is like self-reinforcing essentially. Mm. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, if you think about Google, so Google is largely thought of as being, you know, the company and the, the, the application which developed ad technology, right? This, this is the major paradigm by which you, you know, you build a useful uh, product and you have no way of monetizing it. Well, if you have attention, then you can sell adverts and, and then effectively, you know, you're running a search engine, but really you're the world's largest advertising uh, firm. That's really what you do. Um, and, you know, if you look at the kind of the ways in which, uh, you know, big tech is finance, so the kind of the combination of these two elements, uh, you know, you're looking at venture capital. The whole thing is based on, you know, achieving a certain scale beyond which, you know, you are effectively, you know, you're just a monopoly within that given space. So, you know, you're the monopoly in uh, sort of generic social media, your Facebook, you're the monopoly in um, search, a search or, or you're the monopoly in image based video or, hosting. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and that's the kind of, they're entirely set up to do that. This is what the finance, you know, and most of them won't turn a profit until they reach that point of monopoly domination. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it is baked in from the very start. And, you know, the, the social results of that are all around us. Well, it's baked in from the start, from the moment they start, they need to engage in capital accumulation. Mm. Yeah, they need to do, you know, proper accumulation of massive profits, which they can then speculate on and invest in. They can use to speculate in, in the stock market, etc. I mean, it's not historically inevitable that those technologies or even the, these big monopoly platforms would be used this way. I mean, they could have been 
you know, they could have been run by government. They could have been run as huge workers co-ops. You know, it would be very easy, technically, be incredibly easy to turn YouTube or Spotify or Google into something that is actually just owned by all of its users and doesn't ha have any motivation to accumulate vast profits. And um, and only, you know, it, it might sell advertising, but they wouldn't have to have these insidious uh, algorithms because they wouldn't need these huge, huge bottom lines. So I think it has to be understood as, you know, partly, you know, it has to be understood that that's not inevitable. It's not. It's not inevitable to the tech that it becomes that way. But under con, under the historic conditions of a certain kind of capitalist hegemony, then that's where they end up going. That's where they end up pushing. Yeah, um, give us. Well, I mean, so the and I think like you know, I think people can grasp the sort of the um, I guess the uh, financial interests of all these people involved, right? I mean, everybody's just trying to score big, and the government's not stepping in and saying putting any roadblocks to it, almost like the opposite. Uh, we didn't have sales tax uh, on online for years. I mean, yeah, it was all yeah. these things ostensibly mm -hmm. to sort of like to 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 grow a nascent industry or sector yeah. without any concern as to like, what's the shape of it going to look like when it grows? Because, you know, moneyed interests are going to get in there and they're going to create it in a certain fashion if there's no parameters whatsoever. But what are the, the, what, give us a sense of like the, the analysis of the material uh, political interests that you look at in the course of this as well. Well, I mean, our, our our argument and our account is that there's a sort of there's a convergence between the a various sets of interests. So there's the finance capitalists, the, the kind of leading edge of which are the venture capitalists we talked about, the growing tech industry, also certain political institutions. One of the things we're interested in is the fact that at the same time as all this is emerging over the sort of 80s and 90s, you get the emergence of this professional political class, you know, the people who in the states, the people who are most obviously represented by the Democratic Leadership Council, you know, the people who are going to end up running the Democratic Party, the people who are going to end up producing the kind of Clinton uh, policy agenda. And so all of these all of these sets of interests, we would say, sort of, they converge around the project of what we call kind of actually existing neoliberalism. You know, we make that distinction because, you know, a lot of the scholarship on neoliberalism, as Alex said earlier, I think, is, is primarily interested in the idea that there's this lineage of ideas that starts with think tanks in the 1930s and it gets picked up by these networks of kind of influencers and academics and then somehow it then it gets picked up by people like Reagan and it becomes part of the kind of governing ideology and our argument is that is all kind of true but really I mean if you compare what people like Hayek are actually calling for and you can compare it to what actually happens even under Reagan then under Clinton then under Bush and Obama then what actually happens isn't really dependent on what Hayek thought should happen or Milton Friedman thought should happen. But what actually happens is what is good for this particular cluster of interests, this particular set of material interests. You've got these finance capitalists who've been waiting for decades for some way of liberating themselves from regulation, suppressing organized labor, suppressing wages. You've got big, you've got the tech people. Well, I think we have to recognize our kind of distinctive and they kind of, I mean, they are different, you know, like a, a Zuckerberg is different from like a finance capitalist because he does actually do something I and mean, he writes some code, you know, he produces them. They are kind of different. They are distinctive and they have their roots in MIT and Stanford and they have their own kind of history. And, um, and this kind of professional political class emerges mainly because you know this the the most of the policy agendas that these guys want to promote are ones that don't really have a very broad popular support you know most people you look at opinion polls you look at attitude surveys um you know most people even in, in even in the united states most people if you say to them uh, do you think it's a good idea to tax the rich more, less than the poor uh, to suppress labor unions, to, to really suppress political democracy like in the interests of corporate prof profitability most people are going to say no we don't think that's a good idea. Um, so you need this kind of class of professionals, people working in media, people working in advertising, people working in political parties. You need this kind of class of professionals whose job it is basically to sell us on the program and um, or to make us, to, to persuade us to passively at least go along with it. Um, but then to some extent, everybody, 
at least large majorities of people do have to be offered something. We have to be offered some kind of stake in it. You know, it's in the nature of hegemony that the interests of even a majority of people have to be to some extent realized. So what do we get offered? Well, as we said before, what we get offered in return for all this stuff um, is, is, is a fantastic level of private luxury basically a historically unprecedented set of opportunities to consume you know we all get we get the cheap vacations we get the can we get the gadgets you know we get a kind of we get lots of flavors of coffee you know we get we get to experience at least in our lives as consumers and as private individuals in our private lives we get a level of freedom we get a level of private luxury for most of us which is really historically unprecedented but of course, the cost of all that is we see democracy getting weaker and weaker. We see democratic institutions, collective institutions, all kinds of public institutions getting weaker and weaker and weaker to the point where really after 2008, we would say things really start to shift. You know, it becomes much, much harder for that political class to keep people on side. Fewer and fewer people can be offered the cheap credit, the cheap mortgages, you know, the decent jobs. Young people are visibly living more precarious lives, poorer people, people of color, urban working classes, people in the deindustrialized regions. You know, the list of people who are not having their interests re realized by any of this gets longer and longer and longer. To the point where this all kind of breaks down around kind of 2015, 2016, you know, you get the completely, uh, the you know, 12 months earlier, completely unexpected Trump becoming president, Bernie becoming a serious contender, you know, Brexit happening in the UK, you know, the UK almost breaking up because the Scots can't take it anymore. And um, um, so, uh, and so I guess that's our answer to the question. I mean, that that's the way the kind of, the that's the way in which we see sort of material interests playing out. Are, are we still sort of captured in that p paradigm? I mean, I think like, you know, uh, when I was uh, a, a kid and, and, you know, when I was younger, the, 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 they're, they're just the, the, the definitions of, of these interests were, I mean, you know, it was still pretty nascent, you know, uh, in the early nineties and the, even uh, during, uh, you know, in Reagan years and even in the late nineties, I mean, there was a real sense of like, we've made the deal. The deal is, like you say, we have an unprecedented level of personal luxury. I mean, new, you know, uh, the, the sense in the mid nineties, I just remember looking around going like, I, I, I'm, I, I'm falling behind here because everybody seems to be like, you know, <laughs> new TVs and like all this other <laughs> stuff. And there, we, you know, at one point people start to realize like, oh, we're, we're just on a conveyor belt and we're getting, you know, fed more, you know, like little, uh, you know, energy cubes or whatever it is, but it's getting a little bit tiring to be running this fast on this, uh, on this belt. Um, and, uh, it, it, and on top of the fact that like, like you say, a, a significant portion of people left behind because there's only so many of these, like, you know, things that you can get at one point. Um, and, and so as this, as this starts to, to break, down uh, well l let's shift i mean that, that's where we've looked at like the the material uh the, in, in the political i guess interest here in terms of pushing this because we have a um I, I'm, I'm the the folks with real real money are just pulling away into a completely different universe uh but there's also sort of like a another like subset of of people who they watch those people, you know, go off into the universe and they say like, I want to go there, but they're also slowly moving away from, you know, 90% of the population on some level. Um, what, what, let's talk about like, uh, the, the, the platforms and infrastructures on the tech side that, uh, exacerbate this. I mean, we've touched on it a little bit, but how do they come in and reinforce this or perpetuate it or, or, or juice it in some fashion? Well, what's interesting, you know, if we think we're in a period of breakdown, right, since about 2016, you can kind of see, to some extent, the existing political class um, associated with neoliberalism, the kind of people who, you know, in terms of the sort of Democrats, the kind of people who worship the West Wing, um, you know, they're, they're having less say, their ideas are less convincing, they're having to give a bit more time to people outside that tradition, maybe a little bit more to the left. Um, so that's kind of that's kind of collapsing. Um, but what isn't collapsing? Well, what isn't collapsing is finance, 
and big tech and big tech especially um although it's now facing increasing amounts of you know calls for regulation from both left and right for different reasons um and you know is facing in some cases like for example facebook you know terrible headlines um but they are still very much in position uh for now and you know they are the the communication uh, and, and kind of digital social infrastructure of basically the entire planet maybe apart from you know russia and china um so you know really this is they are the continuity element of neoliberalism you know you could have a situation where you know we you know in the best of all possible worlds elect socialist governments <laughs> um and you know until they heavily regulated these platforms or, or or really we would argue probably go further than that and uh you know um reform them in a more radical way take them public make them owned by their users perhaps or, the, or their workers um you know the basic way in which we interact in everyday life is just it's is literally neoliberal you know it's even if you don't don't like it if you you know have to engage with social media you're engaging with you know gaming the numbers um you know you're engaged with trying to find those emotive hooks that are going to uh you know catch fire and 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 go viral and all of those other things and you know this is continuity neoliberalism in the in the kind of infrastructure of everyday life and even though the politics has is, is starting to shift um at this level of, of the kind of technological infrastructure it really hasn't yeah i think in terms of this question of like where are we now like and, and how continuous or discontinuous is all this stuff it is really complicated and we try to get into some detail in the book because we think there isn't just a simple answer so one of the big debates like amongst economists at the moment at least left economists is is neoliberalism over i mean the era of privatization low taxes now is it over after the bailouts post 2008 after the furloughing and all the public spending the government spending through the pandemic is it now over and our argument is well as a comp as a comp if we understand new neoliberalism as a complex formation that includes that stuff but it also includes say very individualistic competitive culture being normalized in tv in popular music in the, on, on the social media platforms it also includes you know it also involves a situation in which you can't have a figure from the left becoming a serious contender in mainstream politics etc the answer to the question is neoliberalism over is like kind of yeah right. kind of it's breaking down like yeah. it's it's changing it's not we're not living through as big a shift as the 70s. So if we think about that changing dynamic relationship between industrial capital and finance capital, we're not living through a moment quite like that, mm. but there has been a kind of shift. So I would say since 2008, Silicon Valley has really emerged as the dominant fraction of, of capital. It's really takes taken on a new role. It's not like it was in the 90s when there was this kind of alliance between venture capital and the banks and digital, the digital economy and the digital guys were kind of the new scrappy cutting edge disruptors. We're now in a situation in which clearly the dominant figures in, in global capitalism, at least outside China, are Amazon, you know, Google, Facebook, it's Silicon Valley. And they they operate in quite a different way, as Alex said. They operate. They don't operate on the basis of competition, of of like setting up companies, then shutting them down, then asset stripping them. They they actually they do operate in quite a different way on the basis of building these huge monopoly infrastructures that people use. And it's quite early days to say where all that is going. And you can kind of even I think you can and you can but you can see like even in the wider culture, you know, for some people, for some social groups. We're very much still in that kind of cultural historical moment of what we call the long 90s, this sense that really that world is never going to end. You know, the, that, um, you know, my great example of, of this phenomenon that we call the long 90s a couple of years ago was when Friends was the most popular show on Netflix, you know, and um, and I kept saying to people, you imagine, imagine when Friends was first being broadcast in like the mid 90s, imagine the the idea that it was going to be the most popular show on TV on TV like almost thirty years later would have seemed extraordinary. So for some people, there's this continuity, and clearly for for example the people running you know the DNC say 
you know, and the people who are now in control of the Labour Party in Britain. There's a very deep commitment to the idea that nothing can or must ever change. You can never do anything different. But for other people, as we said, for many constituencies, it's very clear for many of us and for especially for many young people, for all those people who've been left behind and excluded, that period clearly is over. We're, we're in a different period. Something else has to happen. It's not entirely clear what. It's not entirely clear what else is going to emerge. Like we, tr you know, we, we tried with Bernie. We've tried with Corbyn. We've had Trump. I mean, and it's very early to say, like, what's happening with uh, with Biden's reforms. I mean, maybe that does mark. I mean, maybe the Biden reforms do mark the end of something and the beginning of something new. It's it's clearly too early to say yet, but but maybe they do. It's interesting that that nineties. I mean, uh, I, I personally like the existence of Friends. I was never particularly a fan of the show, but but in terms of my <laughs> but in, but in terms of my own professional career. I, I I don't know that I would be sitting here if uh, Friends had not uh, exploded the year that I went out to L.A. Like because, you know, I, I was people were very excited about David Schwimmer. And, uh, you know, I was in, within I, I was in a pool of people who, you know, New York sort of Jewy, you know, that type yeah. of thing. And then that was like it was like it was like a, I had you know uh, like a printing press for money at that point but <laughs> but the but but the other point being that in terms of the democratic leadership all of them really became national figures the ones that we have today yeah. during that era and and so yeah. like you know their their tight grip on this is as much as like you know my refusal to to listen to music that i didn't you know hear at uh you know like i i still think that like uh Uncle Tupelo is is like <laughs> these new bands that came out of Uncle Tupelo. I like them, but you know, like I I still have that mentality, even though I, I like Uncle Tupelo existed for like four years in the '90s. I think, and you know, Wilco and Sunvault have been like twenty years each. But that mentality, I think, that, you know, happens with these political leadership. And so, all right, well, so with that said, in terms of like where we are, where these sort of we're almost like at a, a, a riptide where these two different currents are sort of like, and we just don't know what's going to come out of that, that, that riptide. What, where do you guys see the, um, the weaknesses in terms of, uh, of, of where the power lies as to, uh, for opportunities for those people who are, you know, looking to the future rather than trying to maintain this paradigm that existed in the past? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the big question, isn't it? And I think you know you, you've seen in 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 the UK and, and in the states over the last kind of you know five years, the left and particularly you know elements of the left that that, that came up through social movements, so things like Occupy Black Lives Matter, uh, various you know green movements, embrace the strategy of essentially you know as as much as possible going in with the leading political party of the left, trying to influence um, a kind of entry strategy. And we've seen the results of that. And the results of that are not, they're, they're not simple. So in the States, you've seen, you know, the Bernie agenda, it, you know, it hasn't, it hasn't won out completely, but it, but it has had influence. It's done okay. Whatever. It's done okay. Right. Yeah, exactly. Better than anything else. Yeah, exactly. A while. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Bernie in particular, we're seeing the impact in terms of labor in this country. Yeah, like, yeah, I mean, like yeah. there is, you know, we're, we're not where we want to necessarily be, but you can't look at the labor numbers in terms of like what's happening on the ground. And also yeah. to the extent that the administration has sort of greased the wheels for, for labor. That's all burnt. I mean, that, that is, that yeah, is Bernie exactly. influencing Biden. And, and, and um, we can see that there at, at the very least. I mean, you can see that in the UK as well. I mean, in the UK, the situation is slightly different because, you know, it was as if you know Bernie, uh, our Bernie, took control of uh, our Democrats. Um, but you know the end result of that with Corbyn and the Labour Party was kind of political disillusion. You know he never really had full control of uh, the members of Parliament who all hated him. Well, also he was just never popular. I mean, that's well, he was right. very was briefly it? popular, but he was, yeah, ne he was never he was never as popular mm. as uh, as Sanders was. So we're in a period of where the left has become really. Um, you know, disillusioned and don't, you know, they've, they did the social movement thing in the early, two, you know, early 2010s. Then they did the, you know, party politics, electoral politics, and neither of them really worked to the extent that they wanted. But we're also seeing this huge wave of Labour militancy here in a way that has not been the case for, 
you know, 30, yeah, 40 it, years. It's not on the same scale as the States and it's uh, and it's newer, but we're seeing trade militant trade union leaders becoming popular public figures for the first time, really for yeah. the first time since the They're 70s. becoming social media celebrities. Uh, we've because, watched some of that, actually. Because they uh, just yeah. don't bullshit. There's no bullshit. Right. right. Well, also, I mean, I would say also, I mean, this is partly partly the answer to the question, where are the opportunities and mm. also where are the fault lines? Where are the weaknesses? I mean, we should say something about climate because that's where the big, I mean, the, the big kind of the fault lines, even within the capitalist class, I think, fall along those lines to some extent. But to be honest, even, even I mean, a, a lot of the people, even in Silicon Valley, have no interest in seeing the planet burn. And fossil fuel capital is becoming increasingly politically isolated um, and it's increasingly entrenched on the right. And I think ultimately there is going to be, there is scope for something like a Green New Deal, I think, uh, out of that situation. But coming back to what we were just talking about, I, I mean, I would say, you know, and I, I've heard you say similar stuff on the show, Sam, so I know you're kind of sympathetic to this view. Like for anybody like our age who has lived through the kind of ups and downs, the fortunes of the left, you know, really since the early 90s, as you say, you know, for all of the defeats and disappointments and failures, look, the, the Bernie strategy has worked better than anything else mm. that, has, that anyone has tried for the past few decades like we got more out of it and and the and corbyn as well i mean corbyn okay we didn't we're in a bad situation now but there is at least a organized an organized political left to be defeated in the uk now which pre-2015 there wasn't like it didn't exist like there just wasn't a left since the late 80s as i would say pretty much on a national level there wasn't in the states either after yeah. the, the defeats of the, the jesse jackson campaign and the interests so, that they these figures represent they're not going away i mean no. those interests are particularly with you know uh stagflation you know energy crisis these interests are are, are, are really just becoming more and more broad so so to some extent the answer is more of that you know yeah. you've got to keep building on that i think you know we have to keep building on that and we have to keep building out those coalitions and we have to keep doing the and the bits i would say the bernie strategy that have been shown to work and this is kind of consistent with our theoretical approach in the book are where your political project is based on reaching out to as many social constituencies as possible and not scolding them for their cultural views not making a debate over values and identity but sh explaining to them why, why it is in their interest like what is in it for them about coming on board with your project not that it'll make them nice people but how it will make their lives easier and better and how it will make that how it will actually fulfill them on a kind of material level and the bernie project has absolutely been most successful sort of locally and nationally where people have managed to make that case where coalitions of a range of political organizations a range of actors a range of constituencies people from ngos people from unions people doing community organizing have su su successfully built diverse coalitions that are brought together by a sense of their shared interests and I think that is, it sounds really obvious. Like every time I say this, I think, <laughs> well, like, why am I even saying this? this? This is ridiculous. What else would you do? But of course, you know, as I said to someone this morning, you know, every time I go and do a meeting, every time I do a talk about this stuff, every time I talk to people, and this is true, you know, if I talk to people in the States as well as here in the UK, at least a third of the people in the room, it's like it's a new idea to them. It's a new idea that, A, you don't have to choose between doing stuff in the Democratic Party, doing stuff in DSA, doing stuff in trade unions, doing direct action, doing community organizing, doing alternative media. You don't have to choose between those things because you need to do all of them. You know, right. that's the only way we're going to win everything. And also, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to worry about the fact all of the time that you're, you know, about the, the issues that the liberals want us to worry about all the time, issues around identity and values. Sometimes that stuff is important. Sometimes you can't get over it. But for the most part, the task of radical politics is to identify the ways in which large groups of people have common interests and to push that. That's what Bernie did so successfully. It's what, frankly, Jeremy, you know, for all his great um, features, Jeremy Corbyn wasn't really able to do mm -hmm. in the UK. And um, and that is what we have to keep pushing, keep doing more of, I think. And I think there is, in terms of the opportunities, the political opportunities, I think we're seeing it happen now. We know it's happening. But, you know, really, I mean, this was the, the, the obstacle that Bernie came up against, the obstacle that Corbyn came up against, the first one, not the biggest one, not the most important one, but the one that really stood in the way. In, at the end of the day, it was the loyalty of those relatively affluent professional class liberals to that 90s leadership of the Democratic Party. And it was, it was, in my opinion, it was a kind of naivety, really, about the idea that ultimately those professional politicians know what they're doing and have your interests at heart and are willing to kind of um, 
are, are going to try to do the right thing, like like it's an episode of The West Wing or something. Uh, I think it's really for me that's that's one of the, those are the constituencies we have to keep winning over. The, the people who actually turn out for democratic primaries, you know, they're, they're the people we have to keep trying to win over as well as all the others. And the thing that will win them over, in my opinion, you know, most likely if we push on it is, is climate change. Mm. You know, sooner or later, it's going to be apparent to all these people, as it's becoming here, that no people who are in the pocket of finance capital are not go are people who are in the pockets of the banks and wall street are never going to do anything about climate change and i think that i think that realization is one that we can keep pushing and that can really be useful to us i think and 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 i mean i mean to be clear you know the green new deal for instance really has a lot of provisions that will impact labor and the just our whole perspective on on the on on what it means to have a job and uh you know sort of like uh expectations of what the government will do for us i mean uh it, it it's it's not a trojan horse in the sense that like the outside part of it is also really important too but mm. uh to to fundamentally address climate change we're going to have to fundamentally reorient the way that we relate to government and and, and whatnot let i just i want to ask you about the uh the, the platform reformation that you were talking about uh and those ideas because this is something i feel like that has bedeviled us you know quite a bit here is like how you deal with this there is sort of this siren song out there of of uh you know people who are talking about authoritarianism but without any sort of structural solution it's really just like this company evil uh, this billionaire <laughs> evil that one actually pretty good and uh you know less censorious as if there is no you know as if it's not just a question of where they're situated uh, uh, uh you know within this sort of like uh, i guess uh game that's going on but from a structural standpoint, like what is, how do we address these questions, um, uh, you know, of the monopoly that YouTube is, uh, that Google's trying to create, the monopoly that Amazon's trying to create, the monopoly that Facebook is trying to create, um, and their implications as to like, they're, they're privately funded town squares, essentially. Yeah. And, you know, uh, so how do we address that without having, you know, a government board that says like, oh no, this crosses the line. We need to have this uh, comment removed or what is the mechanism for this? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really big question. I mean, the, the answer that, you know, the mainstream Democrats have settled on is essentially, you know, it's regulation, it's antitrust. It's all the, all the stuff coming out of the FTC under, under Lena Khan, who, you know, has her sights set on, who's a very, very smart person indeed. Um, who has a site set on, you know, breaking up some of these big, uh, you know, digital monopolies. And certainly, you know, that wouldn't be bad. I think that would be that would be maybe a step in the right direction. And certainly if you look at, I don't know, a company like Facebook that has essentially just eaten up its competition, you know, in Instagram and WhatsApp, like they should not own those applications. I mean, that's not helping anybody, really. That's not delivering value to anybody apart from their shareholders. Um, the thing is, though, is that if you look at the digital space, you know, monopolies appear to be, you know, they're partly a function of the fact that these are capitalist enterprises, but it's also the function of the fact that it's useful to just have one search engine. It's useful to just have, you know, a place where you can buy anything you want. And digital technology makes those useful functions possible. So the question is, you know, do we could go down the line of breaking them up and maybe in the short run, that's a good idea. Um, but in the long run, you know, uh, the problem with these entities is not as as kind of, you know, certain critics, particularly liberal critics like uh, Shoshana Zuboff, most famously, you know, her issue is, you know, the issue is that they're surveillance capitalism, but her issue is with the surveillance bit rather than the capitalism bit. And, and the thing that makes the surveillance so pernicious, you know, this acquisition of data is the fact that it's driven by these capitalistic imperatives. It's driven, and, you know, and that that perverts the public square. It turns it into something that's being manipulated for profit. You know, how do we actually get, a, get away from that? I mean, I think it's, it's surprisingly difficult because the other option, as you mentioned, um, which would be to have the state step in and run these things, you know, uh, while socialists might like the state in many ways, I think, we, yeah, we should be wary of that. We don't want the state 
um, you know, directly regulating speech like that. And that would it would be hard to get popular public consent for that, I think. So, I mean, I, th I think the, the options that we have are, are, are seem very far off, but I think it, it would be something like, you know, having them run by the people, by, by the workers who work for them or by the users who are, um, who are using yeah, They could be user owned. I mean, yeah. the, te the technology yeah. lends itself to that. There's mm. a lot of work being done by economists and kind of radical policy people on what they call platform cooperatives. And the technology yeah. really lends itself to that. I think you could make a really strong political case for, I mean, my favorite example, partly because I teach a lot of music students, is Spotify. Like everybody hates Spotify. Everybody knows they're an <laughs> evil company who's who, who just who rip off you know musicians left, right, and center. And there's just no need for it. Like the gap, the in the amount of money they take per stream, you know that that much of it is share is to shareholders. That much of it is for running the company, and that much of it is to artists. You just get rid of the bit for shareholders. You know, even artists selling very few small amounts of music could make a decent income from it. Users would have just as good an experience, a better experience. The world would be a better place. All you have to do is take money from that evil little munchkin who runs it, like who, <laughs> who's, who's investing all his profits in building AI weapons. So that's his thing. He's going into and funding Joe Rogan. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, you know, that you can make a very good case for it. Of course, politically, it would be very challenging. And let's be realistic. You know, that that is not happening, in, 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 except in a situation where you have uh, an American administration, which is at least where the current one is, or probably significantly to the left of it, and also a majority of the most powerful countries in the European Union, yeah. you know, in that place. But ultimately, you got to. You know, that's what you got to aim for. You know, that's what we got to think about over the medium to long term. I mean, I would say. That's one answer. I mean, also, I do. We do suggest at the end of the book. I mean, probably realistically, to be honest, like we're probably not going to get to the point where we can turn Google into an international, you know, workers and users own cooperative before we have to really address the climate crisis. Probably in terms of priorities. Probably that's something like a few decades down the line. I think it, we have to have it in our minds as kind of an imaginative horizon. I think it's a really important kind of teaching point to keep making to people, especially young people, that there's just nothing in this tech that means it has to work that way. But probably realistically, you know, Green New Deal is is the bigger priority, and probably, I mean. I envisage a situation, you know, I don't claim to have any kind of, you know, capacity to predict the future, but, you know, I kind of envisage a situation in which, you know, we're going to have to be putting pressure on the tech guys. We're going to have to be organizing. I mean, we, we need to see big labor organization among workers in tech. We need big pressure from users. We need the threat of antitrust. We need the kind of things that people, you know, like, like Zuboff talks about mm. and um, people at Zephyr, what's her name? Zephyr. Zephyr Teacher. Teacher. Zephyr yeah. Teacher. Yeah. yeah is pushing for we need the threat of all that we need some of that done um in order to kind of limit their power but probably you know within probably we are going to have to also find we are probably are going to have to find which of those companies we can kind of work with like which will you know tolerate yeah. which will are going to which of them are going to be willing to endorse something like a green new deal or at least tolerate it because i just don't see the kind of balance of class forces being such that we're going to you know abolish digital capitalism like within my lifetime i might be wrong i might be wrong but you know and that's going to be really difficult it's going to be really difficult i don't like saying it because like you know my right. gut feeling is i just hate all those guys <laughs> you know I, I obviously i hate them for all the same reasons most people listening to and watching this are going to hate them but you know, but the but the oil companies are still there. They, we've got to fuck them first. Sorry, we've got to deal with them first. We've got to deal with them first. I mean, I think first. this. You know, it's. I think it's really important for people to be able to make these assessments and acknowledge the reality of these things, because otherwise, you're out there, and 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 it, I think it's also important too, because it makes people like be aware of who is trying to sell you fool's gold that will take you down a path that really has no, um, has no, uh, you know, beginning middle or it has a beginning, but it doesn't have a middle or an end. Uh, and you just sort of like end up in this sort of cul-de-sac. I mean, one of the things I like about antitrust and, and I think people, listeners of the show know that I'm sort of, you know, uh, it's, it's one of my ballywicks is, is that I think the best, the, the only way to get from, where you're taught to where you're talking about and whatever that looks like there is to uh, undercut the power of these entities as soon and as quickly and as hard as we can, because, you know, 
as Grover Norquist said, he, I mean, he wanted to 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 uh, make uh, um, a government weak enough to 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 strangle it in the bathtub. I, I want to use government to make these entities, you know, at the very least where they're afraid of being, uh, you know, uh, uh, drowned in the bathtub, essentially. Yeah, yeah. And, and you got to get them small enough so they can fit in it uh, at yeah. this point. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's very and, persuasive. And, and, and I mean, I think like I, I see antitrust as a uh, as a as a necessary interim step to anything that is good essentially, uh, that we like. But um, it, I think it's really important also that people can understand this dynamic of the way that it works uh, with, with platforms. It's really uh, fascinating stuff, and I really appreciate uh, you guys uh, coming on to talk about it. The book is uh, Hegemony Now, How Big Tech and Wall Street Won the World, and parentheses, and how we win it back. Yeah. Uh, and, they made us put that. Yeah, I they was going to say, like, you can't write a book about <laughs> politics without the publisher saying, like, well, you got to you gotta include, like, how you change it. Um, yeah. There has to be a call to action uh, type of thing. <laughs> Jeremy Gilbert and Alex Williams, thank you so much for your time today. We'll put a link uh, to that book at majority.fm in the podcast and YouTube descriptions. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks very much. Scott. Thanks very much, Thanks, Sam. Sam. Cheers. Bye-bye.